Bem-vinda! Eu estou feliz de estar aqui hoje. Obrigada pelo convite e obrigada pela carinhosa recepção. Obrigada. Thank you. I'm so glad you are here today, and I am thrilled to be here because this is a topic of music in the movies that I absolutely love, and I hope you will have a good time here today. Um, music, as you know, is one of the most powerful elements of film, but it's one that people don't know as much about, and it's hard to catch our attention. So one of the reasons I developed this project is that I got tired of I would go to a, a cinema, go to a movie, and I would come out and I would say, oh, did you hear that beautiful music, that beautiful score? And frequently people would say, oh, was there music? So it's something that we just have to attune our ears to. So today, what I hope to do is give you a lot of tools for opening up your ears. Now I'm going to say that if you are a trained musician, I don't think you'll be bored, but if you know nothing about music, that's okay too. Because we all have ears and we all have emotions, and I'm going to walk you through it. So, um, we're going to start today. And I will say also that I hope that when you leave here, you will never hear movies in the same way. So, rather than me talk at you right now, let me give you an example, one of my favorite ones, of why Music is so important, so you're going to have to bear with me now. We are going to watch an excerpt from, um, well actually, let me, before we do that, let me just say a couple things on your handout. Um, there are, you know the plots and the stories of music. We've got things like um, man against nature, man against God, man against himself society, all of those themes. These are written and oral themes. Overcoming the monster, rags to riches, comedy, tragedy, etc. But we're going to be talking about the functions of music in film, commenting on the actions. In the early days of film, there was something called Mickey Mouse. We all know Mickey Mouse. In the early cartoons, the music would follow every gesture, that sort of thing. So that is in the trade called Mickey Mousing. It's not used usually anymore, mainly for animation. Uh, but we also have music doing things like commenting on relationships, creating atmosphere, emotions, for reference, sense of time and space, and especially getting psychological reactions or especially physical reactions as they may be poor. All right. So let's go right to this excerpt from the Pride and Prejudice movie from 2005. I don't know if you've seen this movie, but essentially let me boil down the plot for you. What happens is that this is actually an English movie, Jane Austen film, where we have Kieran Knightley, who is Elizabeth, and then we have uh, Michael McFadden, Matthew McFadden, who is Mr. Darcy. So the long and short of it is that they are finally acknowledging their feelings for one another. They are in love, but they haven't wanted to say. There's been a lot of mishaps along the English countryside. And finally, they're having their moment. And it's actually called the dawn scene. So here's where I need your patience. We're going to watch the first clip. No music, OK? So I want you to decide how interesting this scene is and even what are they thinking or feeling with no music. So, first clip. Really? Okay. We are waiting. <laughs> this 
is one of my favorite things to do. Take the music away. Okay, so there's a very beautiful, dramatic scene in this excellent, award-winning movie. Now, what we're going to do, um, I want to just say that this scoring, the music for this scene, is unbelievably beautiful, I think. And you are going to hear bird songs, songs of nature. That's a certain kind of music. Then you're going to hear what we're going to refer to as an ostinato, We'll talk about that later. It's a repeated pattern on the piano. And then you're going to hear the strings, the orchestra, begin and crescendo, and it's moving the scene along until they actually speak. So let's watch the same thing, and we'll watch the rest of it. And for right now, all you have to do is try to just key in on as many different musical sounds as you hear. Fine. You heard the birds, 
you hear the piano and the strings, and we have what we call a crescendo, which is um, an intensification, usually of volume and intensity. And it goes up, 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 up till they meet. And then when they're talking, we hear this low level of music, which we call underscoring. But it's still there, and the birds are there. But as they get to the resolution, when he, they are um, acknowledging their love, the music starts to swell again, and then you have this beautiful profile at the end. So I think that's a good introduction. Anybody else notice anything else that they want to share? Okay, maybe later. All right, now before we go on to some actual classical music pieces that are very crucial to film, uh, I want to take a moment to show a couple of clips that show how musicians hear. Let's say visual artists, they see differently than we do. They don't just look at things, they really see. Musicians don't just um, hear stuff, they really listen. And so anybody, everybody in this room has the capacity to grow their ability to listen. And that's so what we're doing today. But I want to show you two wonderful film clips that illustrate how musicians hear. So the first one is from the very famous movie called Amadeus. Um, and it's about the famous composer Mozart. Anybody see that movie ever? Oh good, some of you have. And it's worth seeing many times. So here's the setup. This is a movie that won so many awards in 1984. It's based on a play by Peter Schaffer. And the director is Milos Forman, and F. Murray Abraham is Salieri. Now, as a music person, I can tell you that the premise of the movie isn't entirely true, actually. Mozart, you know, was a genius composer. He only lived to be 38 years old. He was so, um, everything was so easy for him, but he was kind of, um, he was a child prodigy. He was kind of um, a brat, if you will. He was a womanizer, a drinker, a gambler, a partier, and everything was easy for him. But Salieri was what we would call a grade B composer. He was a good composer, but he wasn't a genius. So there was this rivalry. Salieri was jealous of Mozart. Um, however, the premise of this movie that we're going to watch a little bit of is that Salieri was so jealous that he poisoned Mozart and killed him. And that is not historically probably what happened, but it makes a great story. So at the end of Salieri's life, we see him riddled with guilt, and he tries to kill himself. And in the very beginning, we see that he's trying to cut his throat, there's blood all over him, but he lives. So in those days, he was put into what we would call an insane asylum. Uh, not like a private psychiatric clinic like we might have today, but pretty difficult conditions. So here's Salieri, the priest comes in to absolve him of his sins, and he's telling about the first time he saw Mozart in a court setting. And you're going to hear him narrate the music we're hearing as only a musician would. So there are a couple of instruments that he mentions. The basset horn. Basset horn is part of the clarinet family. And the squeeze box. Anybody know what a squeeze box is? It's, it's a, yes, an old-fashioned accordion, not with the buttons, but uh, 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 that kind of thing. So those are, if you hear the words. But basically he's saying um, that he heard this music and thought this must be sort of a godlike person, but then he sees that he's this just terrible, um, terrible, immature young man. So here's... The music of Mozart playing in the background and Salieri is an old man reminiscing about it. On the page he wrote, nothing. The beginning is simple, almost comic. Just a pulse, bassoons, basketballs, like a rusty squeeze box. Until a clarinet took 
Now, opera is not everybody's favorite thing, favorite cup of tea, but if you know the storyline behind it, you'll like it. But what interests me is that Tom Hanks, he might as well be a musician, because every phrase is important to him. And you're also going to see an interaction between him and Denzel, who is an amazing, there are amazing close-ups here, kind of being taken into this magical world of opera. Do you mind this music? Do you like that? I am not that familiar with that. Oh, this is my favorite word. It's very Kelt. It's not really a shame yet. You better go to a gun. This is Madeleine.
So whether you could understand those words or not, at the end, Tom Hanks, who's so wrapped up, you all have your own favorite songs that you're just like living in. This was his, and he says the last words, I am love. And this is a man who's dying. And you see that Denzel is just wrapped up in this world. But then we have silence. The music is over, and the spell is broken. And Denzel gives us that nervous, ha, ha, well, I better, I better get going. Like, what, what did I just witness? I gotta get out of here. So that's a, those two examples are just um, the power of music and the specificity of it. Now, we're gonna go on and listen to a few touchstone classical works. I'll give you just a little bit of history. But what I want to say is that because you're students of English um, and in narrative, you know that every work of art or literature usually, whether it's um, oral or it's written, has a beginning, a middle, and an end. In music, like in sonata form, in Mozart and Beethoven's time, we call that either ABA or exposition, if we use that term in literature, development, and recapitulation. So the exposition is where all the themes are laid out, the characters are coming to play, the development is when everything gets all sh shooken up, right? Shook up. Because if we don't have any conflict of any kind, then we don't have much of a story. And the recapitulation is not an exact reprise of the beginning, but it's a way to wrap up those themes. So this is very much what is happening in music. Music first came about, ironically enough, to accompany silent films, right? You've probably all seen those. In 1895 in France, the Lumière brothers showed a series of films to an audience and they didn't have any sound, but there was a pianist on stage, um, you know, mimicking the music. So if, for instance, um, a chase scene, um, you know, something like that, or something like this, or System, and it was a way to try to synchronize the music to the action. And then there were the pictures called talkies. This was all very hard. But finally, in the 1930s, they got that syncing available. But in the silent era, going back to that, usually it was one pianist accompanying, they'd watch, and they would either take popular tunes or arrangements of religious tunes, or they would compose their own tunes. In some of the bigger theaters, they had a huge organ that could um, produce more sound for more effect. And in the big cities like Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, there would be actually orchestras. So people started writing what we would call a soundtrack um, or a film score to a company. And that just has continued on. Um, and so, when I teach this class, and I should have said that what we're doing today is telescoping a class that I teach in 15 weeks, all semester, down to about 90 minutes. So we're just going from one thing to another. But I always like to give my students, there are about 10 um, classical touchstone pieces, where if you know these 10 works by composers, you will know so much about what is going into modern film composing, and it helps you know what to listen for. Now, that's different than digital or electronic sound, and we'll get to that at the very end, but for now, we're talking about acoustic sound and the families of the orchestra, the strings, the woodwinds, the brass, and the percussion. So the strings, of course, violin, viola, cello, and bass. Anybody a string player in here? Violin, okay, great. A couple of you were woodwinds, things like flute, clarinet, oboe, bassoon, 
any woodwind players? Okay, this <laughs> one of the same. And brass, trumpet, uh, French horn, trombone, tuba. And we're going from soprano, alto, tenor, bass, high and low, and then percussion, drums. And two types of percussion. Percussion means simply things that are struck, hit, shook, but some of them have pitches, uh, like the big things called the timpani drums. voice and chorus. The music can be a solo, what we call a voice. It doesn't just have to be singing, a solo line, a solo flute, a solo piano. It could be a chamber group, a small group, or a large orchestra or chorus. All right, so I'd like to, we're not gonna go through 10 examples, but I'd like to start getting some music terminology going by listening to famous classical pieces, just snippets of them, that I think you've heard before. So Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is coming up, and it consists of what we call a motive. In regular life, a motive is what? Something that inspires you or leads you to do something, you know? He's got a, an ulterior motive here. He's got a different plan. In music, it simply is a small cell or building block so this famous motive, maybe the most famous motive of all time, short, 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 long. Right? Everybody knows that. So the thing is, in Beethoven's time, he's writing melodies, he's writing a symphony, but Beethoven was a genius about using these little building blocks. So even here, I'm going to show you the difference between a motive and a lyrical melody. Beethoven Short, 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 long, right? And then what does he do a little bit lower? It's the same rhythmic idea, right? So the pitch is this and this, but the rhythm, the duration that is, is this. So it's ba 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 and then it goes But all it is is this motive. Okay. So there's a power of the orchestra, but Beethoven was the master building block, and that's going to become very important later in our film scores. So here is a snippet of that. between a melody that is 
very hard to sing, and one that is just easily that you might be singing in the shower or singing when you leave here. Those are those poor maidens. 
And it's the idea that you give a motive, a musical motif, to a person, a group, a place, a thing. Uh, like you will be thinking maybe of like the ring in Lord of the Rings. And we're going to see later on how very famous composers have used this technique of motivic treatment to give everything a theme song. A very basic example you'll see on TV if you've ever watched soap operas. Um, you'll have a woman um, who's in love with someone, she has her own theme, and then the man has a theme, or maybe they have a theme together. So if you hear that music, you don't even have to see them on screen. You know, oh, that's Luke and Laura, or that's you know this couple. And so what Wagner does is start getting very symbolic in his composition. You have like Tristan and Isolde. These are all uh, Norse myth mythological figures. This woman has a theme, this man has a theme, and when he wants to tell you that they are intertwining physically, spiritually, he mixes those themes together. So it's very complicated, but it's a technique that film composers use a lot. All right, now we're gonna leave the orchestra. I've got two more for you. The next one is a French piece written by the composer Eric Satie. I think you will know this piece. And it's the Genopédie number no. one. It was written in 1888, and you're not only going to hear something different because it's a solo piano, but it represents in film music what I call the solo voice. It doesn't mean you have to be singing, but it's a feeling of atmosphere, of perhaps aloneness, of perhaps peaceful um, tranquility or melancholy. And it has a completely different um, sense than what we just heard.
no words. So it's for atmosphere, big atmosphere.
simple, I think I've used them before, but just to define them, underscoring in film is everything that's happening underneath. We don't see the musicians. It is the film score, it's unseen music, and we have to just um, take, it for, take it for granted that this is part of what's happening to enhance the emotion. But source music, as versus underscoring, is where we actually see the source on screen. Somebody turns on a radio, somebody's got their, um, you know, I, I, uh, what am I trying to say? iPad, iPod on, <laughs> whatever. Uh, somebody's playing, playing music, or there's a, a jazz band playing, we see it. So those two things um, are crucial to notice for specifics. And then finally, just a few um, little tips for when we get going and we're hearing this. When does the music begin and when does it cut out? When is it barely audible in the background? Like you saw in the very first clip we looked at with, with the sound, that when they started talking to each other, the music didn't quit, but it was very low in the background, right? Um, a couple other things. Are there extended periods in the film without any music? Again, that silence. What does that do uh, for the drama? And how does the music make you feel? Afraid, sad, peaceful, happy, fearful, confused? Sometimes the music we're hearing doesn't even jive with what's happening on screen. So then there's a disconnect. And it's either some use of irony or something we have to, you know, figure out what's going on. All right. Now, going on to our next section. What I've done is pair a couple of um, pieces with a film clip. So one of the things that we said with the silent movie um, treatment was that sometimes they would use a classical composition. So I'm going to play you a piece called Thus Spake Zarathustra, which is a tone poem by Richard Strauss, who is a beyond Wagner in terms of sound and German sensibility. And this is a good example of how music is used to set the atmosphere. So you're going to hear this tone poem, and the idea is that it was an, a symphonic work, no words, based on the philosophy of Nietzsche, of, you know, man is a superhuman god, man is superman. And uh, this is a section of the poem called Sunrise. So you either have heard this before or you haven't, but I'd like you to close your eyes and imagine how this might be used in a film, and then we'll watch the clip where it was. Um, and here is the uh, little setup 
of this movie, which is really a big philosophical question. Uh, after discovering a mysterious artifact buried uh, on the lunar surface, mankind sets off on its quest to find its origins and it's the story of evolution. How are you conveying the story of evolution and mankind in a little snippet in movies? Here's how we did it with the help of this piece.
thing to say that is the great John Williams, who is totally amazing. Um, continuation of that idea, we're going to hear the audio and then watch a clip from The Dark Knight uh, from 2008. And again, this is uh, Hans Zimmer continuing the same techniques. Christopher Nolan directed this one. Same ideas, different music.
with this music, a really beautiful, nice piece of underscoring, giving this atmosphere of peaceful, um, a peaceful feeling, but also notice how the music mirrors water movement. An amazing animation. Hello? This is a good magic atmosphere. And it kind of also, when we talk about music commenting on time or space, 
Does it take us to a different time? What, what would that be? Yeah, ancient times, right? Whether it's medieval exactly or Gregorian chant or that sort of thing. So just like that's a, um, a symbol right there that you already know. You don't maybe know the name for it, but you have this lexicon already inside you. All right, with the last bit of time we have, I want to go through, if we can get there, the four um, basic eras, and we're going to start with the golden age of the 1930s, give you a couple of film clips, three from The Wizard of Oz. Granted, it's a little different because that movie is a musical. A musical, of course, is when there are musical numbers and people are singing and dancing, etc. That was very big in the lush 1930s when there was a lot of money and they kind of had casts of thousands. But I want you to see the original of Judy Garland singing um, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. You remember this is a movie about a girl who's stuck in Kansas and um, she wants to go away from home, she's tired of everything, and then she has this fantastical thing, it's actually a dream, but um, in a tornado, Kansas in the U.S., in what we call Tornado Alley, is full of these storms. The house picks up and lands in the magical land of Oz. One epic thing that happened in this film is that it's all in black and white until they get to Oz. And then there's the Tin Man, the Scarecrow, and the Lion, and she meets up with these people, and of course the force of evil, the wicked witch. Um, but in the end, she realizes, ah, oh, you know, um, click my heels three times, she's got the ruby slippers. Home was always right here. She wants to go home. Now, one thing I always like to tell my English students from other countries, if anybody know when you say, oh, we're not in Kansas anymore? Anybody ever heard that? You will hear Americans say that, and it's like, what comes from this? Or she's saying, oh, Toto, her dog, we're not in Kansas anymore. But it just means like, wow, we don't know where we are, this is really strange. If you hear that, that's the reference. So let's just listen to her singing this beautiful song, 1939. Um, to motive and ostinato is in the horrible Miss Gulch who becomes the witch. You'll know this thing, I believe. that are 
kind of um, discordant, and you know something is vastly wrong. All right, and then the final clip from The Wizard of Oz. Um, this is the rescue Dorothy scene, and it's another example that they are using an existing classical piece by the famous Russian composer Modest Mussorgsky called A Night on Ball Mountain. You're going to hear a lot of the Wagner and Strauss techniques that we've talked about already. Um, and this, is, this piece is from the 1860s, and it was sort of a witch's Sabbath piece, brass, strings, and something called agitato, which um, it means agitated strings, that gets us agitated. And then one other thing, it, the, on your glossary, if you got it, there was a word on stinger, or stinger chords, or scare chords, and it's one discordant thing that you're going to hear. The hourglass has red sand in it, and it, her time is running out. Dorothy is captured, and you're going to hear this terrible, ugly trumpet uh, chord, scale chord, and then a little bit later, at a higher pitch level for intensity.
And now we're going to skip to the outer world and watch a tiny clip from the day the Earth stood still. 1951 is a very cheesy um, trailer to introduce the movie, not the, not the subsequent remake. And this is Bernard Herrmann, who was a very famous composer, again, a European transplant who worked a lot with Hitchcock. And um, here's the trailer with the theory. Space creatures. <laughs> Anymore than we do. You've got a round to the house. She may be unable to answer. 
neck. Uh, we're going to go to the shower scene simply because this chord is really important. We're going to watch it without the music, the static. Producing a sonic barber pole. 
a noise that appears to keep rising in pitch forever and ever without ever actually going anywhere. I was reminded of it this week by FallingFalling.com, a creation of internet artist New Raphael, where the shepherd tone seems to go down and fall forever. Raphael also makes other cool sites like outinthewind.com. Here, there's nothing except for this menacing wind that slowly erodes the cursor. Alright, just one last example. Dunkirk has, throughout three quarters of the way of the score, this unbearable tension. These men are stranded. It's a World War II picture if you haven't seen it. And then the English are coming to rescue them, just people in boats, fishing boats, etc. So this is when they realize they're going to be rescued and Hans Zimmer combines this terrible tension with a beautiful classical piece by Sir El Edward Elgar which coincides with the concept of home.